Hey, what's going on everyone? Greg here. And of course the fateful day has finally arrived. September 10th, Apple's event is now over. And there were a lot of announcements, maybe some that we were expecting, some that we weren't, but Apple definitely moved over this keynote very quickly and they left out a few details on some of the devices we are going to cover today. But first, let's get into it with services because I don't wanna to spend too long on this. Basically, there is going to be Apple Arcade. They showed off some games like Frogger, very mobile friendly games, but they should work across all of Apple's devices. And Apple Arcade's going to be coming in at just $4.99 a month. I think that is a good price, especially if the games are actually good for it. And that is a great price, especially with family sharing. So if you have a family with up to six people, you can all play those games at just $4.99 a month. And if the software is good, it should be a pretty good deal. Now, moving on to Apple TV Plus, this was a little bit more of a surprise because up until this event, we heard a lot of rumors that Apple TV Plus was going to start at $10 a month. And a lot of people were thinking this is going to be a very hard sell with competitors like Netflix and now Disney Plus coming in at only $6.99 a month for their streaming service. It didn't look like Apple was going to have a leg to stand on here, but Apple actually surprised me and I think surprised a lot of people by not only offering their streaming service at $4.99 a month, which is pretty respectable. That's not too much money for a streaming service despite the fact that we have to see what kind of content's on there right now. It looks like pretty slim pickings, but over the years as it builds up, $4.99 is a good price, but also that they will be giving out Apple TV Plus for a year free when you purchase any of their iPhones, Macs, or iPads, I believe. So if you consider it that way, Apple TV Plus is going to get into the hands of millions of people right away just from buying one of Apple's hardware products. And if they keep that going, I think that can make Apple TV Plus probably one of the biggest streaming services right out of the gate. Okay, but services are a little less interesting to me, so let's move over to some of the hardware announcements at Apple's event today. The first announcement was a bit of a surprise because it was an iPad, and we really weren't expecting any iPad hardware to be at this event, but Apple started this off with the seventh generation iPad, and that is the budget-friendly iPad, which starts at $329, or $300 if you are in education or a student. And for the older entry-level iPad, I have constantly said that this represents one of the best values in Apple's lineup, and it looks like that is only getting better starting today. Now, don't get me wrong, this is still a budget-friendly iPad. It's not going to have all the fancy new features of the iPad Pro, and it's still gonna come in under the iPad Air. However, it does get some respectable new features that I even wasn't expecting for the budget-friendly model. So of course, most importantly, it retains the $329 price point, but it's also getting a slightly bigger screen going from 9.7 inches to 10.2 inches. It's also going to retain first generation Apple Pencil support. So unfortunately, no magnetic charging Apple Pencil like the iPad Pro, but at least we are still getting Apple Pencil support of some kind on a very inexpensive iPad. One of the big additions to the budget iPad is that it will now have the smart connector, which is also available on the iPad Air and of course the iPad Pro. That means that you'll be able to attach a smart keyboard to the iPad and that is a huge upgrade for the budget-friendly iPad. This means that especially if you are in school, if you need something that is a more inexpensive device, you can get this iPad now running iPad OS, which offers a bunch of productivity improvements like better multitasking and better external storage support. You can get this device, attach that smart keyboard to it, and you'll have a pretty decent laptop alternative starting at $329. This iPad is also going to weigh around one pound and it's going to be made from completely recycled aluminum, which is a big win for the environment. However, there are some things that Apple kind of skimmed over. They were going very quick through this event and some of that includes that this will be shipping with an A10 processor, so not the fastest processors. Now that we have the A13 and the new iPhones, we'll get to that later, but the A12 is on the iPad Air, so you're going back to chip generations with this iPad. Still a very fast and very capable chip, but it's something to be aware of. Another thing that you'll probably wanna be aware of is that this iPad smart keyboard is the same exact smart keyboard as the iPad Air and the older generation of the 10.5 inch iPad Pro. 
So if you still have one of those laying around, if you see a deal on one of those older keyboards and you're planning on getting this iPad, make sure you pick it up because it is the same exact keyboard and it will connect the same exact way through the smart connector. All right, let's move on to the Apple Watch Series 5, another bit of a surprise announcement because some people were speculating that maybe Apple would just iterate on the Series 4 with some new case finishes, but they actually went ahead and did a whole new generation model and it actually has some pretty surprising improvements that weren't even leaked. The biggest improvement has to be the always on retina display with LTPO and it's still going to have the same all day battery life. Apple is going to be achieving this a couple of ways through that LTPO process and one of the ways is they're going to be lowering the refresh rate on that screen to around 1 hertz when it's in the always on display mode. But that's fine, this is something that Apple Watch owners have been asking for ever since the first generation of Apple Watches. And this was a feature that was not leaked anywhere and I was pleasantly surprised to see an always on display make its way to the Apple Watch. That means that when you look down at your Apple Watch, it's always going to have the time, it's always going to have your complications available, also going to make your Apple Watch look nicer instead of always having a blank black screen. Whenever you're walking around, you'll actually get to see a preview of that display. Now, this is probably the biggest improvement to the Series 5. There are some other improvements that just aren't as big as previous refreshes. They've added some improvements with International Emergency Calling SOS. Apple is also launching two new Apple Watch editions, the first one being a titanium with a regular titanium or a black titanium version. And this is going to be 45% lighter than stainless steel with twice the strength. It's going to have a brushed titanium finish and resistant to stains and fingerprints. We're also getting a return of the ceramic edition in white. Now for the most part, the Apple Watch Series 5 is going to retain the same pricing structure as the Series 4. So it's going to start at $399 for the 40 millimeter case for that aluminum version. And then if you wanna add things like the cellular, that's going to be an additional $100. And then if you wanna bump up the size from 40 millimeter to 44 millimeter, that's going to be another additional $30. Now, one of the things that Apple didn't cover in its keynote was how expensive the titanium and the ceramic versions of the Series 5 Apple Watch were going to be, but thankfully I have that information available for you right now. So the Titanium Watch is going to start at $799 for the 40 millimeter version. And then if you wanna bump that up to 44 millimeters, it's going to be $850. If you wanna get the ceramic finish, that's going to be a much more pricey $1,299 for the 40 millimeter, and then an additional $50 for the 44 millimeter. That is pretty expensive for an Apple Watch. So at least the titanium version was only about $100 more than the stainless steel, but yeah, that ceramic version, it looks nice, but it is very expensive. Another thing related to pricing is that the Apple Watch Series 3 will be going down to only $199. This actually sounds like a really good deal. The design is a little bit older and definitely doesn't look as nice as the Series 4 or now especially the Series 5 with the always on display. But for $199, that is a very, very capable watch. And I think that is going to be a big hit with customers. And it's definitely something you should consider if you're in the market for an Apple Watch. Do you really need all the fancy new features? If you really just need a lot of the basic functionality that the Apple Watch offers, if you just want to track your workouts, your health, the Series 3 might be just the thing for you. I also wanna go over a few more things that Apple didn't cover in the keynote regarding the Series 5. That will be that the Series 5 is getting an S5 chip. Now what's strange is Apple didn't tout that they were upgrading the S4 to the S5 and on the website it says that the S5 is twice the speed of the S3 chip and I believe that was the same marketing for the S4 so I'm not really sure What's new about this S5 chip? I guess I'm going to have to test in my review if it's any faster than the Series 4, but apparently it is a new S5 chip if you were wondering if Apple was upgrading it. Another thing that Apple didn't mention is that the Apple Watch is also getting a boost in storage for the Series 5 model. So it's going from 16 gigabytes all the way to 32 gigabytes. So the Apple Watch is actually getting a pretty respectable amount of storage for loading on things like music and podcasts. And I guess now with watchOS 6, we can also load audiobooks from Apple Books and that might take up a lot of space. So maybe you'll actually fill a 32 gigabyte Apple Watch, but I just find it funny 
that in 2019 we have the Apple Watch with 32 gigabytes and we also have that brand new iPad which was just announced and that also starts at 32 gigabytes. All right, let's move on to the main attraction of Apple's September keynote and of course that is brand new iPhones. Now Apple introduced the iPhone 11. This is going to be a replacement not for the iPhone XS and the iPhone XS Max but a replacement for Apple's best-selling phone last year and our personal favorite on this channel, the iPhone XR. Of course, the iPhone 11 is going to come in a wide array of colors with black, white, yellow, and product red, and now adding green and purple onto that as well. The iPhone 11 is coming with the same 6.1 inch liquid retina display as the iPhone XR. However, it is getting some brand new speakers that support spatial audio that will have sound fields that give you a more immersive experience. One of the bigger improvements to the iPhone 11 is its brand new camera system. So of course you're going to get a 12 megapixel wide camera, but now you're also getting an additional camera on the back, a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera that is going to be able to take ultra wide photos. And that's a bit of a surprise. When we initially heard iPhone 11 rumors, we heard for the longest time that the second lens would be a zoom lens and not an ultra wide angle lens. So aside from shooting in the ultra wide angle mode, you're going to be able to take portrait mode shots with that wide angle lens. And you're also going to be able to do portrait mode for pets and objects and also Apple's effects like their new effect in iOS 13, high key mono. Another improvement coming to the iPhone 11's camera is a night mode. This was a big hit on competitors' phones like the Google Pixel. So it looks like Apple is finally adding a night mode. What's cool about this night mode on the iPhone 11 is it's going to be able to be automatically turned on. We're also getting some improvements to iPhone video as well. So you're going to be able to transition seamlessly between the regular lens and the ultra wide angle lens. And you're going to be able to quick take video now by tapping and holding on the shutter button in the Photos app. The front camera is also getting improvements on the iPhone 11 going from a seven megapixel to a 12 megapixel sensor. And you can rotate it to the landscape mode to get a wider angle field of view. It's going to do 4K video at 30 and 60 frames per second and include slow motion video. Of course, like any new iPhone, we're also getting a brand new A series chip. So we're going from the A12 chip to the A13 chip. Now Apple is claiming that this will be the fastest CPU in a phone ever. And they're also claiming that it will be the fastest GPU in a phone ever. We'll have to obviously test this ourselves when we get our hands on the iPhone 11, but Apple's claims to having some of the best smartphone chips are no joke. Their A12 processor was super, super impressive, and I just can't wait to see what this A13 chip is capable of. Now, one of the best features about last year's iPhone XR was its battery life. It had stellar, stellar battery life, and apparently the iPhone 11 is going to get an additional one hour of battery life over the XR, so this sounds like it's going to be another impressive iPhone with its battery life performance. Now there were some other things that Apple didn't really go over that well. So one of the things is that the water resistance on this phone is going to be IP68 with up to two meters of dust and water, and it's going to be resistant for two hours and 30 minutes of exposure. The 11 is also getting a brand new U1 chip, which uses ultra wideband technology for spatial awareness. And that's basically the features for the iPhone 11. It looks like a pretty respectable upgrade from the iPhone XR. However, one of the best things about the iPhone 11 is that it's actually coming in at a lower price point than the iPhone XR at $699 for the starting price, and the iPhone XR started at $749. So $50 less than the iPhone XR starting price, but I think that's going to be a big win in the eyes of consumers. All right, and let's move on to the final announcement of this event, and that is the iPhone 11 Pro. So the iPhone 11 Pro is a replacement for the iPhone XS and the iPhone XS Max. It's going to come in a stainless steel enclosure, much like the iPhone XS. However, this time it's going to feature a matte back glass finish. It's still coming in the same display sizes, so 5.8 inches for the iPhone 11 Pro, and then 6.5 inches for the iPhone 11 Pro Max. It's going to feature up to 1200 nits of brightness when you're watching HDR video, but typically you should get around 800 nits of brightness. It's going to support HDR10, and Apple is calling this the Super Retina Display XDR. 
The iPhone 11 Pro is also getting a massive upgrade in the battery department with four more hours of battery life on the iPhone 11 compared to the iPhone XS and five more hours of battery for the iPhone 11 Pro Max compared to the iPhone XS Max. Apple is also thankfully including a 18 watt fast charger in the box and that's gonna go from USB-C to Lightning. These iPhone 11 Pros still have a Lightning connector on the phone itself. Another thing Apple didn't really mention in this keynote is that the iPhone 11 Pro is going to be getting enhanced water resistance features, now going to IP68 with four meters of protection. Now, by far the biggest and probably most pro feature about the iPhone 11 Pro and the time Apple spent the most on was the brand new three camera system. The camera is going to have a 12 megapixel sensor with a regular camera, an ultra wide camera, and then of course the telephoto camera. The telephoto camera is getting an improvement from the 10s going to f2.0 which is going to let in 40 percent more light so you're going to be able to capture a lot of different perspectives with the wide angle the ultra wide angle and of course the telephoto camera and the iphone 11 pro looks like it's going to take a very similar photo to the iphone 11 just with the addition of all those three lenses now, the biggest feature coming to the iPhone 11 Pro that the iPhone 11 doesn't have isn't coming until a future software update. I think that's a bummer. I really wish it launched with this feature because this is the long rumored feature we've been hearing about where the iPhone 11 Pro is going to take a bunch of shots at once and be able to combine them together to give you a much more detailed photo. Apple is calling this feature Deep Fusion. It's going to use machine learning and AI to combine nine images together and then analyze that all in one second to give you an optimal photo. Apple called this computational photo craziness, and yeah, it kind of is. So not only is it going to be doing computational photo like they've been doing with Smart HDR, but now it's going to combine all those three lenses photos together. It's going to stitch and combine those different lighting techniques and it's going to give you a much more detailed photo. This is something I really wanted to check out at launch. I think this is going to be the biggest deciding factor on whether you should go from an iPhone 11 to an iPhone 11 Pro. But unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have to wait for a future software update before we're able to use this potentially really awesome feature. Of course, Apple also touted the video features of the iPhone 11 Pro, and all of the cameras are going to be calibrated at the factory, so all of the different lenses will give you the same color, and it will be a smooth transition as you transition from ultra-wide to wide to telephoto. You shouldn't really notice too much changes in exposure or color. Now, the iPhone 11 Pro is going to launch at the same price as the iPhone XS and XS Max, so $999 for the iPhone 11 Pro, and then $1,099 for the iPhone 11 Pro Max. Now, before we end this video, there are a couple things that Apple didn't announce with the iPhone 11 Pro. One of them is that the iPhone 11 Pro will not be getting 3D Touch, so that's a feature that was exclusive to the iPhone XS and XS Max compared to the iPhone XR. Another thing Apple didn't really go over too much was that the Face ID system is going to be improved on the 11 and the 11 Pro to allow for more angles. They kind of showed it off in the promotional video, but didn't really cover on stage. Another thing Apple neglected to say was the starting configurations for the storage. Now, before the event, it was rumored that the base starting storage would be 128 gigabytes on the Pro models. Unfortunately, it is still starting at 64 gigabytes, even at those high price points. So still the same storage options as last year with 64 gigabytes, 256 and 512 gigabytes. And that's basically all the information I could gather out of this event so far. I'm sure there is a lot more information I'm going to have to go through, and I'm sure I'm going to be updating you throughout the entire week on more in-depth Apple coverage, probably giving you dedicated videos on the iPhone 11, the iPhone 11 Pro, the Apple Watch Series 5, and probably even that 10.2 inch entry-level iPad. But anyway, hopefully you liked this video, hopefully it helped you out. If you did, make sure you give me a like. If you wanna see more from my channel, make sure you're subscribed. If you wanna support the channel out in any way, make Make sure you check out some of the links in the description. Also be sure to let me know what you thought of this event. Were you hyped? Did it meet your expectations? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. And as always, I will see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.